would go on record to this bill to say this bill is not about big farming, but about being able to keep our small family farm, rural farms, and even urban farms operating without having to worry about a Dean Newsom. It may be perfect legislation that you are doing for the farmers. I am not against that. But sometimes there is a backdoor consequence. Lawmakers square off over whether to make it harder to file so-called nuisance lawsuits against farmers over issues such as bad smells, noise, and pollution. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers on this day 23 of the Georgia Legislative Session. I'm Donna Lowry. We'll have more on the debate over the Freedom to Farm Act coming up. And later we're, we'll hear about a bill to start a pilot program to educate young people on urban farming. Also today, I look at one of several bills to determine how electric vehicle stations will operate in Georgia. Convenience store owners have concerns and they've turned to lawmakers for help. And some of the uproar in schools during the pandemic has led to accrediting agencies checking into a few districts. Some legislators want those agencies to face more accountability. On the health front, the Georgia legislature continues looking for ways to improve maternal mortality. One bill would require a review of pregnancy-related deaths. We'll get to all of that after we get a wrap-up of the day's news from our lawmakers, Capitol correspondent Brenda Waters. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Donna. Talking money in the Senate today, the Senate passed a nearly $30 billion mid-year budget that includes raises and bonuses for about 300,000 state, university, and K-12 through employees. The Supplemental Appropriations Bill, HB 910, made its way to the Senate today. While many of the governor's and House proposals remain unchanged, the Senate did add some tweaks of its own. First up, pandemic programs. Senate position supports the Silence the Shame program, which supports mental health and community wellness and outreach. In line 62.4, you'll see where the Senate position also supports Kate's Club which is a nonprofit that provides grief support to bereaved children for issues that they previously were not facing before this pandemic. And in various other line items in DBHDD, you'll see 1.25 million that was added for respite services, along with an additional 250,000 for non-medical, non-emergency transportation to help with those who, are, who would benefit from such programs. Health care was also a priority. The Senate added over $37 million to low-income Medicaid and Peach Care and $1.5 million for Peach Care Mental Health Services. School nurses also will see a pay increase. And the Senate proposal, because of Senator requests, various and many, uh, numerous Senator requests, adds $4.1 million at line 149.8 to provide school nurses with parity to the teacher increase you'd see as well. It'd be $2,000 for every school nurse on top of, in addition to, or as well as what there's being paid to teachers. $20 million added for rural Main Street Development Grants. An additional $300,000 added for youth summer nutrition meals, as well as $100,000 to help address food deserts information for lower income communities. Correctional and juvenile justice officers will see an even larger pay increase than the House proposed. The Senate uh, proposal will include uh, almost double down on the governor's $5,000 raise, adding an additional $4,000 on top for those two um, agencies for sworn field positions, again in juvenile justice and the Department of Corrections. The Senate bill also puts aside almost $190 million to match federal funds expected in the coming year. Earlier last year, um, Congress passed the Federal Infrastructure and Job Investment and Jobs Act, and that does potentially make Georgia eligible for substantially more federal funds. There's a state match of roughly 20 percent. Uh, that would leave a, a one to five return for the Georgia on, on state dollars paid forward. But the dollar is large. We would potentially have to put up somewhere between 150 and, and $250 million to, to make our state match. But Senator Tillery also said they wanted to be prepared in case the current economy falters. Right now we're in a position where cash seems to be on hand. I'm not sure we'll see that in 23 and as we move into the 23 amended and the 24 next January. So many of these moves you will see now 
uh, we do have to take and, and make sure that we're making conscious decisions that we're being prudent with taxpayer dollars and not incurring expenses now that we can't move forward later. The Senate voted for the bill unanimously, and it was sent back to the House for their review of the amendments. And in the House today, a bill cropped up to protect Georgia farmers from their neighbors. But opponents point out farming operations are no longer isolated just to rural areas. House Bill 1150 passed in the House this afternoon, 10262. It's called the Freedom to Farm Act. The bill should be titled Save Our Family Farms, or really maybe the Good Neighbor Bill. I'm a good neighbor who who's, has family farming. I work for a living tirelessly to preserve our lands so that my son and granddaughter can continue to work on our farm for the next generation. This bill is aimed at discouraging nuisance lawsuits against farmers filed by their neighbors. Representative Robert Dickey says House Bill 1150 is needed because farmers and non-farmers are now living closer to each other than ever before, and this bill would protect the farmers. But urgent urban encroachment is happening all around Georgia farms, and it will continue and get worse. People who normally have not lived around a farm or agriculture operation are now living right next door. Under the bill, neighbors who object to noise, smells, dust, or polluted water coming from farm operations could not sue if the farm has been in operation for one year or more. The one-year statute of limitations would not apply to any confined animal feeding operations like a chicken house or a hog farm. I could dot all my I's, I could cross all my T's, and I could still get sued for a nuisance suit. If we want to ensure a safe food supply, Georgia-grown food supply, to be able to have our kids be able to move back to the farm, back to rural Georgia, and begin farming on their own, we need to pass HB 1150. But not all legislators gave the bill a nod of approval, like Representative Viola Davis, who says one of her neighbors is running a hog farm in her Stone Mountain neighborhood. It may be perfect legislation that you are doing for the farmers. I am not against that. But sometimes there is a backdoor consequence to your legislation. They are getting ready to destroy the American dream of home ownership in Georgia. Despite the opposition, House Bill 1150 passed 102-62. And finally tonight, a special honor to Georgia's Native American tribes. Senate Resolution 504 will dedicate a red cedar tree to be planted on Capitol grounds. And that is my Capitol report. Donna, back to you. That sounds very nice, Brenda. Thank you. We're going to focus on a few pieces of legislation now, including one to get a handle on the vehicles that the agencies that accredit schools. First, we want to learn more about one of several bills regulating the growing electric vehicle market. The International Energy Agency reports that as of 2020, the U.S. had registrations for 1.8 million electric vehicles, three times more than in 2016. Today at the Capitol, legislators, staff, and visitors had the chance to view several electric vehicles. In addition to a Ford, an Audi, and a Volkswagen model, the Clean Energy Organization had a Tesla on display and offered test drives. A Pew Research Center study shows seven percent of adults say they currently have an electric vehicle or a hybrid, and 39 percent say they are very or somewhat likely to seriously consider buying one. Joining me now to talk about electric vehicle bills and more are two senators who are members of the Regulated Industries Committee, Republican Senator Lindsey Tippins of Marietta, who is an ex officio member of the committee and the chair of the Higher Education Committee, and Democratic Senator Gloria Butler of Stone Mountain, the Senate Minority Leader. Welcome to Lawmakers, both of you. I'm Thank thrilled you. to have Thank you. you. Right. Senator Thank Butler, you. we're going to start with you. <clears throat> Senate Bill 492, bipartisan support, and it is, you're one of Senator Mullis is the main sponsor, but you're the second signer. Yeah. The bill establishes a framework for electric vehicles. 
So I want to start with why do you think there needs to be a bill about this particular subject? Well, because this is something brand new. Um, well, maybe not brand new, but um, it needs to be a way to do it, do it all, not just jump in with both feet and not have some guidelines to, you know, guide the market, guide the way it's regulated and the way um, people respond to it. Uh, electric vehicles. I didn't get to. Um, you didn't get to try test drive? it out. Oh today. man! I wish wow. I, I could have, <laughs> but I was busy all day. Yeah. But um, I think it's an exciting market for for us to get into. It will bring uh, economic development to Georgia. Uh, it will allow, as you stated, convenience stores, rest stops, truck stops to have the charges for the vehicles. Um, so I, I think that as we move forward, things will fall in place. So one of the areas of the bills deals with the, um, the charging stations in particular, mm -hmm. right? And it deals with the retailers, like the convenience stores, mm -hmm. who feel that they're competing with the power companies, like Georgia Power. So tell me what the bill would do when it comes to that part of it. Well, the electric companies will make, distribute, and sell the power to the retailers. And then they, in turn, resell the electricity to consumers for fueling their cars. And the bill would allow such resale to not violate the Territorial Act. Second, it creates a level playing field for EV charging providers. Uh, today, an electric service provider can pass along the cost of EVs charging to all of the ratepayers, whether they have an electric vehicle or not. And that's the one thing we don't want to happen. Yeah, the, the big concern is that Georgia Power will have its own charging stations and be able to um, Having a, mon a monopoly. Mono monopoly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that has, I think that's the biggest fear of why, you know, it's working out the way it is. Uh, because Georgia Power has always had a monopoly on electricity. And this bill, the, but this bill makes them come up with, I guess, uh, some kind of subsidiary that will be on the same level as the convenience stores or anybody mm -hmm. else who has the charging station. Yes, yeah, so that they will, like you said, be on the same uh, level playing field and everybody will be charged the same rate. Uh, although there, is, there are two tiers, uh, a smaller uh, charging station and then a larger charging station, which will have uh, different prices. So all of that has to be worked out too. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, I just learned today that there is money coming from the federal government that Georgia will get $135 million that can be uh, used for infrastructure for the charging stations. And we have until August 1st to get that money distributed and to figure <clears throat> out what, how they're going to use it. So it sounds like we're trying to figure it all out before mm -hmm. everything gets going now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm sure we're going to talk more about this uh, coming up. I want to sp switch to you, Chairman Tippins. Um, you're sponsoring SB 498, and that looks at accrediting agencies. And that has been a concern for you because of the accountability when it comes to the agencies. What bothers you about what's going on with some of these accrediting agencies for school districts? Well, I really feel like uh, if you look at the history of it and the, the exposure I've had when I was served on the COP school board, uh, I was there for 12 years. I think we had three accreditations, may have just been two. We were aware as board members that the accreditation process was going on, but never really got into the weeds. Uh, maybe I was interviewed one time, uh, one of the years I happened to be chair. But when I g went to the Senate, started serving on Senate uh, Education and Youth Committee that uh, oversees uh, K through 12 education, 
I looked, actually looked into one of the accreditation reports and asked the question, well, where's the piece on student achievement and academics? And I was told, well, we don't do that. We basically do an evaluation of the board and how, uh, how well they get along the policies that they have. And it was, it, was, it was strange to me that the core business of the education establishment was not part of the accreditation process, and I felt like it should be. We, and we've had some school districts in this state get into trouble when it comes to accreditation, and it hurts the students sometimes getting scholarships and that kind of thing. What would your bill do? Well, if you look at state law, we do not require accreditation, but to access HOPE scholarship, you have to come from an accredited high school. But it would be a disservice to people to say that you do not need high school accreditation, mm -hmm. because if you're traveling out of, if a student's going to school, going to college out of state, they need that uh, from a recognized accreditation agency. Um, what my bill does is put the focus where the focus should be, which is on the effectiveness of uh, the efficiencies and effectiveness of both teaching and learning. And it structures the bill where 80% of it would have to do with an evaluation of the, the broad spectrum of academic achievement and student success. Um, the exact parameters of that, the bill defines that the um, that the Georgia Department of Education would would lay out basically the metrics that would be applied and the areas that would be evaluated, but it would all feed back into student achievement. Um, Eighty percent of the evaluation would would be around student achievement. Twenty percent would be on financial efficiencies. It would also uh, only mandate that high schools be accredited. The state DOE would, at invitation of the local board, could offer an accreditation of elementary and middle schools, which they should be able to do that because of the vast amount of uh, data that we already collect. Yeah. The board would, all, I mean, the bill would also um, make subject to open records any complaints that may lead to an investigation. And that, that would be critical of, of having uh, open records protection. Uh, another aspect of the bill is that uh, the, accredit the accreditation agency could not provide remedial services for any deficiencies that are pointed out. So it's not... And that's been part of it, hasn't it? That's, that they, that's, they, they sweep in, they, they say there's a problem, but we can help you, and then they charge money for charge. That's, I, think, I think it's... Uh, I think it's uh, uh, basically a questionable practice when uh, when the overseer has no oversight. Um, well, and so that's what the bill really attempted to do. We're going to keep an eye on your bill. I, I, I don't want to cut you off, but before we, you leave, uh, we've got to talk about the fact that you announced you're not going to run again. And your colleagues really, there was an outpouring of affection about that, and they uh, gave you a proclamation. That, what was that like? Did you expect it to be that way? Well, I, I knew they were going to do a resolution, but they uh, had invited my family down. It was very special. They were very gracious in their remarks. Yeah. And uh, I, I value the friendships I've made in the Senate on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, well, I think they're going to miss you. I want to thank you so much for coming on before you wrap things up. And thank you so much, so much, uh, Leader Butler, for coming on also. Good bills that we're going to keep up with, okay? Thank you. Right. Coming up, we'll dig into what's behind legislation for a medical examiner to make inquiries when a woman dies during or shortly after giving birth. We'll also look at getting kids involved in urban farming. You're watching Lawmakers on GPB. Cigna is a proud partner of Georgia Public Broadcasting and Georgia Lawmakers. Cigna's mission is to improve the health, well-being, and peace of mind of those we serve. More at Cigna.com to learn how you can help support your employees' physical and emotional well-being. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy, 
The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. Georgia Humanities, connecting people and communities across Georgia to encourage conversation, education, and understanding. Find out more at www.georgiahumanities.org. We are the Southern Environmental Law Center. At SELC, we not only take on the toughest environmental challenges, we win forcing the removal of more than 250 million tons of toxic coal ash, defeating repeated attempts to bring offshore drilling to our coasts, and securing clean air and water protections for communities across our region. Your most powerful environmental defender is rooted right here in the South. Welcome back to Lawmakers. We're going to talk about one way Georgia is trying to get a handle on its high maternal mortality rate. And we'll look at a proposed pilot program for getting kids involved in urban farming. Joining me are Democratic Representative Mandisha Thomas of South Fulton and Republican Senator Ben Watson of Savannah, chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee. Welcome to Lawmakers, to both of you. So Chairman Watson, I'm gonna start with you. We know the issue of high maternal mortality is something Georgia legislators have really tackled, really been working with. Um, the problem is something that a lot of people don't quite understand. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, you know, it's terribly unfortunate that Georgia ranks, you know, depending on the year you look at, 49th or 50th is in the worst relating to maternal mortality. And that's having to do with postpartum after you're delivered. So after they deliver the baby up until a year or so, that's the measure. So it's it was something that we actually created a commission about and uh, and they had recommendations for us. Yeah, so you, you, you have bills, Senate Bill uh, 496. So tell us about it, what you're looking to do. Well, there, there are a couple of things that the commission recommended. You know, the two major things were, you know, number one, one, to extend the benefits, Medicaid benefits, up for one year postpartum. You know, a uh, year before last, or last year we did it six months. Before that, I think it was maybe two or three months. So we extended it. That was the number one thing that we did. And of course, it goes along with that is the money that goes along with that. You know, Governor Kemp put that in the budget, and then we put it in code uh, just recently here in the Senate. And of course, it will go over uh, to the House. Yeah, so that was a big one. You got that one passed. But now you've, you have another one that... Uh, earlier this week came right, out of the Senate. Right, uh, Senator Burt carried that. Uh, that has to do uh, with uh, the cause of the death. So when they did the reviews of the deaths relating to postpartum uh, death, so they didn't know what the death was in about 50% of the cases. So that's the real question is why? So we needed the data so that we can, we can know why is that. And that's why we brought this legislation forward so that that adds one of the reasons the medical examiner, if needed, will need to do an autopsy so that we'll know what happens. How will, who will determine whether an investigation is warranted? Well, certainly, you know, locally, we always push things locally, right? So we try to get them, uh, them involved. So it's going to be the coroner. Will they know that? Are they attended by the physician? Is that aspect already known? Do we know actually what the cause is? So if it remains unknown or unattended, then that will be more likely to uh, have an autopsy. Yeah, explain that the difference with it. Attended is somebody helps you with the birth, right? Or well, explain that. Maybe I don't right, have it right. I, you know, listen, I practice You're medicine. the doctor, so, sir. So uh, <laughs> attended means a, as in under the care of a physician. Okay. So attending physician. Okay. And so whether it's attended or not may make a difference in things. Right. Certainly if, if there's not been any touches relating to health care and someone suddenly dies, then you wouldn't know the cause of that death. Yeah, a lot of support for that, Bill. We're going to change gears a little bit now and talk about something totally different, urban farming. <laughs> Representative Thomas, yeah. you're on the Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee. So tell us about your interest, first of all, in agriculture. Where did that come from? The interest came out of a need for District 65. Uh, it's suburban, it's rural, and it's urban all at the same time. Um, agriculture is needed in my district in the urban areas. And so I'm one that is being a conduit for the urban farmers to stand up. Yeah. You have parts of your area that are food deserts, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Parts of the area is food deserts. And this is mainly where this bill actually came out of. So all summer I've been working on House Bill 1. 
1-800-273-0309. And it's funny because um, Representative Paula Hicks from Ohio contacted me after she saw the work that I had been doing uh, reported in Black Enterprise. And she asked me about doing a bill and I said I'm working on this bill and so we actually became the Agco 3 because her and Ms. Nina Coulomb, also representative out of Kentucky, we are all dropping the same piece of legislation. So tell us about the legislation. So, like you said, it's a pilot program, and it's for ages 11 to 18. Initially, I did have it at 6 to 18, and we thought we need to curtail that more. And so, basically, it's for pilots to come on through the school systems and the uh, Cooperative Extension of Georgia. Yeah, the, the UGA Cooperative Extension Service. And how would they be involved? Well, they liked the bill so much that they created a program to it. So we started it off with three actually pilot agencies. So we looked at Coweta, Douglas, and Fulton for the urban areas. Each one would get 10 participants per agency office. Yeah, and I have to say that you have a, the youngest farmer, certified farmer in the state in your district, right? Yes, I did. Kendall Ray, right? Yes. And so, so I guess that shows you there is interest by young people in this. Definitely. And I mean, it's so important for our state because we are the number one as far as the industry. But what a lot of people don't know is that Georgia is not the number one state for agriculture. But we can be if we include that population of urban farmers. All right, then. I'm glad I gave Kendall Ray Johnson a shout out on all of that. Yeah. Okay, we're going to talk to turn back to you, Senator Watson. You have uh, S SB 403 today. It's the co response Act. Tell us what that was all about, because it's an important part of what we're going to see in terms of policing now. Well, it is. You know, Possibly. this session, uh, like many sessions we've had in the past, and I'm sure we'll continue to address mental health, but this is one of those places, I think, in the state where I, I hope we, we already have six places in the state of Georgia that have this going on. We hope to spread this to the rest of the state. And what the co-responder bill does, it takes place of, uh, instead of when a person's in a crisis, like jumping off a bridge or walking down the middle of the street, it, instead of being police going to that scene, we may have co-responders going to that scene where a policeman dressed in casual clothes, not uh, in a uniform, goes in an unmarked car, he has extra behavioral training, and he goes with maybe a licensed clinical social worker who has training from that perspective. So we would like to de-escalate uh, that situation. And as a matter of fact, six places have done it. You know, I'm, I'm sort of proud because I'm from Savannah, and you know, Chatham County was the first one to do it. But you know, Athens Clark has done it also. Forsyth has done it. Uh, Rockdale and Gwinnett have, has done it, uh, and and a couple of other places. Forsyth has done it. You know, the statistic that one of the uh, the police cited was that when they were going to scenes where there was a behavior crisis, it was a 90% arrest rate. And that means going to the emergency room where mental health really is not a good place to be and then going to jail where mental health is a terrible place to be. So they've dropped it from 90% down to 10%. In these areas that have In already these areas where, where wow. these places that are already doing that, uh, it was a 90% arrest rate down to a 10% arrest rate. And you know, listen, the only conflict I've had with this particular legislation is that one of the other places that was doing it already said that they were at 80% and they didn't believe the 90%. <laughs> so listen, if that's the worst thing that we come against, then I think we've done pretty good. You've had a lot of support. Is there a, um, a f what's the financial piece on this? Well, interestingly, you know, my area had a federal grant, a $300,000 federal grant. And you know, the Chatham County actually latched onto this idea because it was not putting people in their jail where they had to support. Yeah. So it reduced their overall Overhead and they're supporting it also. It's not taking any state money yet, uh, but you know, that's to be determined. All right, we'll see what happens. I want to thank you both for being here today, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for Lawmakers, and we will be back next Tuesday. Have a good evening.